The price of wheat was higher in 1947 than it is today in 1977. Thirty years ago, it was $2.29 a bushel on the farm. Today, it is under $2 a bushel. What effect will the low price of wheat have on other commodities? Phil Allen, an FO News analyst, will have this story along with these others. How NFO Collective Bargaining Block Selling Influences Markets and NFO Barges Rolling More Big Export Sales and the new qualification to NFO Dairy by USDA. Also, why it is important for women to be active in farm organizations and how you can veto a new tax. And now, here's Phil Allen. Devon Woodland, Vice President of the NFO, talks about a dangerous situation in the price of wheat in comparison with other commodities. If the wheat market is not corrected, it will destroy every agriculture market that we have. For example, we now have wheat that is selling for less than feed grain, and in most feed mixes now in the feedlots, 40 to 60 percent of the feed is wheat blend. This means then that if wheat is not corrected, that it will displace corn, it will displace barley and other feed grains. Now when this takes place, then those who would normally raise the corn and the barley or the feed grains, milo, will turn to soybeans. And this would cause a massive acreage increase in the soybean planting, and then within a 12-month period it would destroy the soybean market. So what we're saying is that with wheat at feed grain levels, as far as markets are concerned, it will produce cheap meat, both in cattle, in hogs, and that in turn will destroy all agriculture markets. So we must concentrate on the problem, and that is to correcting the wheat market as it now stands today. This is a Chalk Talk. Shelley Robertson, head of NFO Specialty Commodities, knows about the ups and downs in commodity market prices because NFO is selling on it in blocks. On a blackboard, he's drawing a line showing the old marketing system. Phil, this is a diagonal line indicating a rising market and what people usually do. It's always been the attitude of most farmers to sell 100% of their production at the top of the market. Well, now the first question I would ask is, how do you know when you've hit the top of the market? Can you predict uh, what the top of the market's going to be for soybeans, say, this year? Well, the answer is obviously no, you can't, and neither can anybody else. And the important thing is, is that people hold their product and wait for this market to continue rising, as I've got with this diagonal line here. They hold, hoping they get a better price, and they only know that they've missed it when the price drops sharply. And then, of course, they sell. Now, this has been their habit. Now, NFO says, well, doesn't it make more sense if that's the proposition you're going to use for selling your product? Why not try at least five times? You'd have a better percentage of chance of winning than you would if you did it just once, wouldn't you? All right. Well, then, if that follows, why not 12 times if you, on your operation, could do that? So, hopefully, once a month, sell as the market's going up instead of waiting for it to break and then losing that price. So let's start down here on the bottom part of this line at, at a lower market and see how NFO would apply its marketing techniques to raise the price and see that the farmer ended up something better than what he's ever done before. Let's sell right here at this level, which is down at the bottom of the line, uh, Phil, at a price, and this is just a figure, but we'll say $4 for our illustration. All right, now, the buyer buys at $4, and to make a profit, he must sell for something more than that. Right. In our illustration, let's say that he sells for $4.50. Now, he has that ability to raise the market, always has, and I don't believe anyone would argue with that. So he sells at 450. Now we say, all right, fine, let's sell a little more at 450. Now we have again sold him product at 450. Now what must he do at that level to again get his profit? He has to sell for more, doesn't he? He has to sell for a little more. So let's say again, for illustration purposes, that he sells for $5. And again, we sell. Now, do you see how this trend has started? We started at four dollars, then four and a half, and now we're talking five dollars. All right, we continue on selling as the market rises instead of holding, until we get to the figure that we call cost of production plus a reasonable profit. 
And now we'll try and stabilize it at that. That's right. The logical question is, well, fine, when you get there with the mechanism you're talking about, how do you hold it? All right. When we get at the mythical figure of $7.50 in our illustration, we're going to call that the cost of production plus reasonable profit in this illustration. Then we would start contracting out ahead, forward contracts for a month, two months, and so on at that same price, thus guaranteeing the buyer that he could buy it at the cost of production plus a reasonable profit, no longer a fluctuation in the market. He would have the product when he needs it. That's a very important point, Phil, because in the old days, the buyers ran the market up, as I'm drawing on this diagonal line here, then they would break it sharply to get the product because you wouldn't sell on the market going up, but you would sell when it broke because you knew if you didn't, it'd be less. Yeah, you'd panic into the market. That's right. Then if enough people didn't sell, the buyers would run it up again, like I'm drawing another diagonal line here. It looks like a sawtooth now. And then they'd break it again sharply, and then more people would sell. And that's the way they got their product. And they had a name for this process of running the market up, breaking it, running it up again, and then breaking the price down again. Well, what do they call that, Shelley? They call that milking the market. Well, Shelley, are you hopeful that uh, farmers can stabilize this market? Not only hopeful, I know that it can be done, Phil, because it's been done in the past for short periods of time. Remembering that you must sell when the price is equal to what it costs you to produce rather than wanting more. Being willing to contract out ahead will guarantee and stabilize this market, and that's our goal. That was Shelley Robertson, head of NFO Specialty Commodities, showing how forward contracting in blocks can stabilize a market. NFO barges are in the news, and I'm going to talk now with the man in barges for the NFO Grain Department, Jack Cruz. Can you describe the NFO's barge system, Jack? I'd be happy to, Phil. Right now, we're loading uh, five barges today. There's one at Clarksville, Tennessee, Owensboro, Kentucky, Peru, Illinois, Montrose, Iowa, and Davenport, Iowa. These are just part of the system that we're using. Uh, the river systems, basically, is, is what we have to use. We're on the Ohio River at Aurora, Indiana, at Owensboro, Kentucky, and looking at Paducah. We have barged in the past out of Paducah. On the Cumberland River, we use Clarksville, Tennessee, and there's a barge loading there now. On the Mississippi River, we can load all the way up and down, uh, starting at Minneapolis, Minnesota, down to Winona, to Red Wing, Minnesota, Dubuque, Davenport, Montrose, and we go right on down to St. Louis. On the Illinois River, we're using uh, barges at Peru, Illinois, and there's one coming in this, this weekend for Pekin, Illinois. Missouri River, we use Blencoe, Iowa. There's supposed to be one at Blencoe Monday morning for loading with yellow corn. Omaha, Nebraska, uh, Jefferson City, Missouri, those are on the Missouri River. The Ar Arkansas River, we've looked, we have loaded at the Port of Catoosa, Catoosa, Oklahoma. We are looking at Pine Bluff, Arkansas right now to load. Uh, these will, this system gives us a flexibility to move out corn or soybeans or wheat at a decent price where we can com be competitive with other markets. River markets traditionally have been good. We have to get our members uh, to load their own grain uh, to save money. Uh, here again, though, the, the savings goes right back to the member. Now, what is the general strategy here? This, uh, you've described a pattern to me. It seems that this is grain moving out of the United States downriver to the Gulf ports, right? That's correct. Basically, anything we put on a barge, heads for New Orleans, is destined to leave the country. A great occasion. Occasionally, someone might sell one off on its way down, and it will be delivered domestically. But by and large, 98% of the barges are for export. Can you give me any idea of how much volume this NFO system of barges is moving? Well, b what we're trying to achieve now is to have 20 barges load every week, which will give us 20 barges. It takes a month to get down there. So if we have a two-week cycle of 10 bar 20 barges, 20 barges, we'll be, we're talking about 2 million bushels. Per week? Per week. Now this, uh, as I understand it, there are about how many of these barge points? 16? There are 16 barge points we actively use. We're looking at four or five new points to start loading at. The, the pattern we would like to see, we don't ne need the bricks and mortar. What we need is basically a, a truck dump where they have a pit to go into with a belt going out to the barge. That way you don't have money tied up in storage facilities. Now, as this grain moves out of the United States, does the NFO have contracts overseas? Yes, we've had contracts overseas as well as, as uh, domestic. Uh, without a terminal, 
someplace to accumulate the grain in New Orleans or at the export ports. It's rather difficult to do. Uh, we have had contracts with overseas buyers, and we are looking for new ones. In fact, we have a 11 barge contract up for bids now. Uh, of course, we'd like to go overseas with it directly ourselves. If not, we will sell it to uh, whoever the highest bidder is at New Orleans. If you were talking to grain farmers all across the United States, and in a sense you are, you know, Jack, what would you say to them? Here again, it's one of our philosophies we've always talked about. Let's move 20% of your grain at a time. Uh, don't move it all at once. We're trying to move some of this yellow corn out. As the crop comes nearer now, we can see corn all around us coming up. Uh, the price of your commodity becomes is worth less, your old crop. So we're telling them to uh, get an orderly fashion. Let's get into this and start moving some of this before the bottom drops clear out from under it. I've been talking with Jack Cruz, who is in charge of barge traffic on the great river systems of the United States. Here's Don Burkon of NFO Dairy to tell us about a recent broadening of the qualification for NFO Dairy operations. This expanded authorization was issued by Herb Forrest, director of the USDA's Dairy Division, effective April 1st. Well, what does this all mean, Don? One reason the new qualification is important to the NFO is that our members producing milk will no longer have to put together a reload structure in order to participate in the NFO collective bargaining program. They can now have NFO bargaining representation in the independent plants they are currently shipping to. This representation could also include the testing and monitoring of NFO members' milk for both weight and butterfat content. Well, Don, how will this work out area by area? It will complement our present program in areas where it is not currently feasible to expand our dairy reload structure. The new qualification gives us an opportunity to put together blocks of production within independent plants, and then at the option of NFO members, assemble truckloads of milk for shipment into new markets or through NFO reloads. The new qualification gives us a much better bargaining position in areas where NFO's reload system is not yet extensively developed. Doris McElwain is coordinator of women's activities for the National Farmers Organization. Here is her view on why it is important today for farm and ranch women to be active in agricultural organizations. It's a matter of pure economics. No matter how big a producer is today, he is not setting his price, which has resulted in low producer prices, and the ranch wife and farm wife must also live with those economics. I must point out, though, all farm organizations are not the same, and NFO has no competition in agricultural collective bargaining. There are many farm organizations, both general and commodity, many with auxiliaries. These groups can do two things, promote an idea or a product, or number two, be a legislative pressure group. These two approaches have not been successful in stabilizing farm income. We want women to become more involved in NFO, lending their leadership abilities to the only farm organization that has the capability of attaining cost of production plus a reasonable profit thereby solving the economics she and her family must live with. The Department of Agriculture will conduct a referendum among cattlemen from July 5th to 15th. Registration to qualify will be between June 6th and June 17th. The proposal is for research and promotion of beef. If it passes, individual producers will be assessed three-tenths of one percent on their gross receipts from the sale of cattle, both beef and dairy. The money will be spent by a board of 68 members to be appointed by the Secretary of Agriculture, partly for beef cattle research, but also to do advertising. A handbill put out by the opponents of the measure, including members of the National Farmers Organization, says this. You can veto a new tax. The beef research and promotion assessment is not called a tax, but it will be collected like a tax, it will look like a tax, and it will feel like a tax. It will cost cattle producers another 40 to 60 million dollars annually. In listing the pros and cons, the handbill says, supporters believe the program will increase beef consumption, reduce cost of production, improve marketing methods, set up research on nutrition, health, and marketing development, and they speak of increased export sales. The opposition points out that the cost will run 40 to 60 million dollars annually, that actually beef consumption is related to consumer income and not advertising. 
and that the United States government is already spending 28 and 7 tenths million dollars a year on research, and that exports of beef have risen from 21 million dollars in 1969 to 110 million dollars in 1976. This fund would create a jackpot for the Secretary of Agriculture and the 68-man board to fritter away on salaries, per diems, public relations firms, foreign travel, and whatever else it takes to spend the 40 to 60 million dollars. It also says, remember you don't vote against it by not voting. You must register and vote no. Every voter must register in person or by mail between June 6th and June 17th at their local ASCS office. Those who don't register can't vote in July. Eligibility to vote. Anyone producing cattle in 1976. One vote per family or producing entity. Voting dates between July 5th and July 15th in person or by mail through the ASCS office by those and only those who have registered. Uh, refunds are possible, uh, but rather complicated. Producers can fill out a form and demand refund if they object to paying a levy. Experience indicates that big producers get most of the refunds. Little producers tend to let it go. The order can be approved only if 50% of the registered voters actually cast ballots and two-thirds of that 50% approve the levy. There's a Kansas cattleman who made a good point recently in his letter to the editor of the Belleville, Kansas Telescope. Adrian Polanski challenged one of the contentions of the supporters of the cattle tax idea. Now they're saying that it's a self-help program. While well, Polanski replies, the beef program is not self-help. It is a government program. It is also a tax. You must pay under threat of a civil penalty of up to $1,000 for each violation. It is binding on all cattlemen and dairymen who sell cattle for any purpose. Someone is going to have to keep records on every sale by every person to everybody. A favorable vote in July would create a governing body of 68 members, and these members would be nominated by a select group of so-called producer organizations and then be appointed by the Secretary of Agriculture. That was the view of Adrian Polanski, a cattleman from Kansas. Remember, the outcome of this referendum will be decided by cattlemen who register and vote. Phil Allen for NFO News, and that for today is something to think about.